Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are having a very exciting program today. We are going to be learning about whales today. So thank you so much for joining us today here at the Aquarium of the Pacific for our, our Aquarium Online Academy. If today you do have any questions during our program, you want to share any observations, you want to tell me what your favorite whale is, you're definitely able to do that. Um, so we do have this live text line you can use, and the number is right here. It's 562 two eight six one eight three eight so if you want to share anything like that you can definitely use this number but if you are watching this program any other day that is it august 27th i believe the day is just all blurred together time is going so fast but if it's not maybe august 27th from 9 to 9 30 in the morning you're still able to send in your questions observations anything like that but instead of using this live text line you're going to be using this email it's live at lbaop.org and I am definitely not alone in the studio today. Um, we do have Kaya. She's going to be on the computer changing everything that's going on behind us, showing us all the different really cool whales out there. And we also do have Jen who is using this text line. So if you want to say good morning to Jen, ask her how her breakfast was because she just finished, you can definitely do that as well. But with that being said, like I mentioned, we are going to be learning about whales today. So I want to get started by making some observations of whales and their natural habitat. So let's see where Kaya is going to be taking us right now. And here we are. Let me move off of the camera and we can get a good look at this. And like I said, this is their natural habitat. So the water looks pretty rough, right? Keep your eyes peeled though to see if you spot anything sooner or later. Um, this is a video from NOAA as well. Um, so NOAA is an organization that stands for National Oceanic Atmospheric administration we got there so that's a um, it stands so they go out and they do different studies on different animals depending on what they want to find out so oh here we are what type of whales are these if you know it you can shout it out you can whisper it you can tell someone next to you you can say it in your brain write it down anything like that these are orcas so these are orcas we're observing so you can see that black and white coloration on them Oh, now we're getting a really nice underwater view, huh? It looks kind of rough when you're at the top, but for them, that's something that they're used to. The rain or things like that don't really bother them um, at all, but you can see there's a bunch of them. So sometimes whales will hang out in pods. Other whales might be more solitary, so like a blue whale. A blue whale is the largest whale, um, so it doesn't really hang out with anybody. Um, but these orcas do hang out in these pods and are known to have more of a family social dynamic so there'll be more than one of them together commonly but let me move off of the camera again and you can just take a good look at these orcas and i do want to mention that orcas are the largest dolphin so you might be thinking i thought they were a whale and okay so dolphins are a type of whale but not all whales are dolphins i'll say that again dolphins are a type of whale but whales all whales aren't dolphins but these um orcas then just dolphins in general are a type of whale they're part of the tooth whale family so you do have two different types of whales out there you have whales like the orca that are going to be tooth whales and i actually have some teeth i want to show you um, as we speak about that so i'll take you over to my explorer camera and we can observe some teeth and just give me a second explorers i'll fix the lighting for us to be able to see and did you know about tooth wheels versus baleen wheels i'm very very curious about your thoughts but these are two different types of teeth that we have from whales this one over here is from a sperm whale and i know it's really really big but when you see this tooth in their mouth imagine this is in their jaws and then this is the part that's sticking out right on over here and then this is from a different type of whale i want to say this may be from an orca yeah this is from an orca and it's the same thing only this part is the thing that's sticking out so what do you think whales that are tooth whales are going to be eating mm. so they could be eating like orcas can be eating seals sea lions bigger fish this one over here from the sperm whale is also able to eat those different things but like i mentioned 
So there are tooth whales um, that are going to be having these teeth and going to be having those diets, but there are also baleen whales. And what baleen whales are, they're essentially filter feeders. And I do have this really cool piece of baleen I want to show you. Actually, let me just grab it for all of us to be able to look at it. This over here is baleen. And Kaya has put this really great picture of a humpback with that baleen all inside of its mouth. So this is a humpback whale, and they are one of the baleen whales. So whales like humpback whales, gray whales, blue whales, those are all baleen whales. And what do you think, if they have something like this, what do you think they're going to be eating? Just look at that mouth and all those plates. They're going to be eating really, really small things like krills and plankton. Sometimes they'll eat schooling fish, but small ones like sardines and animals like that. So they'll go. Sometimes they'll go and they'll open up their mouths and just let all the water and everything rush in. And then they're able to push the water and everything out of their mouth and then lick that krill or whatever is stuck in that baleen for them to be able to eat. Other times, whales like gray whales will actually go down to the bottom of the ocean, dig this baleen down in the mud, and then push the mud and the water out of their mouth and then eat the krill and everything that they manage to get. So just different techniques for different whales. And that's how you're even able to identify a whale. Sometimes if you've ever been on a whale watch or anything like that, um, you're able to see the scrapes on the side of a gray whale just because they go down and dig that baling, like I mentioned, down in the mud, which is really cool. And if you're wondering what this baling is like, imagine if you had dry spaghetti in your mouth instead of teeth. That's essentially what it's like. And it can get really, really long, and it's really nice and strong for them as well. And you can see all of those different plates of baleen um, that they also do have. So that's just a little bit about tooth whales versus baleen whales. And it does look like I just got a question in. Oh, so it's from DVA Homeschool, and I'm being asked what kind of whale is from Free Willy, and that is an orca. So those orcas we are observing, the orca we can see now is the type of whale that is in Free Willy. So thank you so much for your question. Once again, friends, if you do have any questions, you are more than welcome to send those in. But next, I do want to talk about what makes a mammal a mammal? Because whales are actually a type of mammal, so they're like us. So I want us to think. There are five things that make a mammal a mammal, typically. We're going to ignore the two exceptions and not even mention them, pretend that they don't exist, um, because most mammals are sharing those five characteristics. We always try to not use absolutes in science because we never know what's out there, what exists, and typically there's something that doesn't follow the rules. That's just how it works most of the time. But there are those five things that do make a mammal a mammal. So let's think, think about them. And if you do know any of them, you can once again feel free to send it in, shout it out, anything like that. So let's see. Maybe we can watch a whale video and maybe you'll be able to figure out one that's important to the whales because they go in the water but also out of the water. So what do you think they're doing? So we're a mammal as well. So you can also think about the things that we need to do or the different features that we have as well. And let's see. Let me move off of camera. Kaya has put this a beautiful sunset video up for us. Ooh, it's so nice. Maybe if someone's sitting next to you, you can have them blow some air in your hair and you'll feel like you're on the boat. Oh, there we go. What was that that you just saw? That was a blow, right? Let's see if it happens again. The whale did just go down. This is another humpback whale that we are observing. So let's see if it comes back up. Oh, there we go. Another blow. So what do you think that blow means or signifies? Um, so what that blow is, ooh, and Kaya has put this picture up for us. So that's what happens when they come up to the surface and exhale. So they breathe 
air just like we do. So when they come up and breathe that air and um, that condensation occurs, you get this blow. And depending on the type of whale it is, it'll be different sizes. So some blows are really small, like the gray whale. The gray whale is actually said to have a heart-shaped blow because the way that their blow holes are positioned on top of their bodies makes it heart shaped and other whales like those humpbacks will have that bigger blow that we were observing but it really does vary but that is one of the ways actually explorers that if you ever got on a whale watch you can spot these whales is by that exhale and that's actually one of my favorite things about when i go whale watching is that we're able to hear that exhale because these animals come in all different shapes and sizes right so just being able to hear that is definitely one very cool thing and often you can actually spot the whale before um hear the whale before you spot it when here kaya, kaya has put up a sperm whale for us so just look first of all just look at the size of this whale it's absolutely spectacular but we saw that blow and ooh, we got a really good look at that fluke, which is that tail that we just saw. But you can see that blow is definitely very, very important. So that is the very first thing that does make a mammal a mammal. And it's that we have to breathe air in order to survive. The second one. Hmm. So the second one is that we are all warm blooded. So our temperature has to stay constant like that. We can stay really nice and warm blooded. Um, and that's why things like fevers and things cause so many different effects because they alter our temperature. But mammals are going to be warm blooded. They're going to breathe air. The third one I want to talk about. Um, here we have a humpback whale, um, just to let you know. But the third one I want to talk about is something that's on maybe your head. Maybe you don't have any on your head. A lot of people have it on their head though. That's hair. Um, so hair slash fur is how we're gonna categorize that one. <laughs> but hair, so you might be looking at this whale. Let me step off the frame and being like, it doesn't have hair, right? Just Im close your eyes and just imagine a wig on it. No, I'm just kidding. So typically by their nose section, they'll have little hairs. And dolphins actually, when they're first born, will have little mustaches and just they'll fall off. Um, so mammals are going to be having hair, just it's not always going to be like we imagine hair on our heads or maybe you're thinking of a sea otter or different animals like that. It does look like I did just get a question then though. So before we continue with our what makes a mammal a mammal, I do have Caleb who is asking what do killer whales eat the most? Which are these orcas, they are referred to as killer whales as well. So there are a few different types of orcas I do want to mention. So depending on what orca group you are observing, um, they're going to be having different diets depending on their location, of course. Um, so the southern resident orcas will actually be eating salmon. Maybe you like to eat salmon too. Kaya is raising her hand. She loves to eat salmon, I bet. Um, so the southern residents would be eating salmon. Kaya would fit right in with them. Um, the offshore population is going to be eating rays and fish. So they'll go and get all those different foods out there. Then we have the transient population who is eating almost exclusively only mammals. Um, so they're going to be eating dolphins, seals, sea lions, and sometimes they'll even eat gray whales. So just a bunch of different diets, right? Depending on the animal, where you can find them, what pod you're observing it can vary really great question caleb thank you so much which just bring me to my fourth what makes a mammal a mammal that i want to talk about and that's that we do eat milk when we're born and you're like eat milk we drink milk but whale milk is very very fatty and it's very chunky <laughs> imagine if you're eating tapioca pudding when you were first born essentially or like cottage cheese that's what um they're milk is like so here you can see um the vaquita yeah <laughs> the vaquita and you can see baby and it's mom so sometimes the baby and the mom will hang out just they're not exactly like us they don't stay with their mom until maybe they're 18 years old and then move out typically the mom shows them what they, um, they have to show them for the first year of their life and then they'll let that 
baby um, go on after that one year. A really great example of that that we actually see down here in Southern California are gray whales. A lot of the times we'll notice juvenile gray whales are in our waters and we're able to take note if we've seen them before or not. And here is one of these gray whales that I am mentioning as well. And if you're asking, how do we know if we've seen um, these whales before or not? There are a few different ways you're able to identify them. Like I mentioned here at the aquarium, we do do whale watches with an outside company and we do have photo ID interns on those boats. So those photo ID interns are able to take pictures of all of these different whales and animals we may be encountering and it goes into a bigger system and here's a really great example of different things that do occur with pictures, taking notes of different things, where you saw them. We even have a GPS that we use too to mark those different points and we're able to put it into that bigger data set and see if that whale has come before, if it hasn't, or if it's just not returning. And then we're able to look more into that as well, which is how we're able to see if these juveniles, if it's their first year um, doing this migration or not, because those migrations are very, very long. They do have one of the longest migrations of any mammal ranging around, I want to say the 14,000 mile mark. Um, so they'll go all the way to Alaska and then to Baja, California, typically to have their waters. And I want to ask you, why do you think that they do that? Why do you think they want to have their babies in Baja, California? Hmm. So if we think about how Baja, California is, there's a lot of little lagoons in there which can actually protect them. And it's pretty easy um, for them to be able to just be in there and not have to worry about anything, especially when they first do have their babies. And here we have some gray whales um, actually that we can take a closer look at, but they'll have their babies down in Baja, California. And then for that first migration, baby will go with mom and they'll go up to Alaska. And then that's really nice, nutrient rich, cold water where they're able to eat all the krill that they could possibly want. And then after that first migration, the next year, typically that juvenile gray whale would then do that trip on their own. So mom is teaching um, that baby the path as to how to get over there and they'll separate often, but you would be able to observe um, sometimes these gray whales, these younger ones do like to hang out with one another. And it's definitely very, very cool to be able to see. So there we had that they eat milk, right? So that brings me to my last and final one, which I kind of give away when I was talking about um, why they have their babies and different things like that. They do give live birth because imagine if this gray whale or even a blue whale who's even bigger ranges anywhere from around 80 to 100 feet laid an egg. <laughs> That's kind of funny to think about, right? So that egg would be like the size of a car and then that blue whale would have to sit on that egg. That wouldn't really work out. Um, so they do give a live birth. And here is one of these blue whales that I am um, speaking about. Oh, and just watch this video and how that blue whale was able to open up that mouth and get all those different things fish. Oh, wow. And it does look like I am getting a few questions. So I have DVA homeschool is asking, what are the tan spots on the gray whale? Is it debris from the ocean? That is a really, really great question. These are actually barnacles that you're observing. So gray whales do have barnacles on their body and they can have anywhere from around two to 3,000 pounds of barnacles on their bodies. And I know when you think about it, you're like 2,000 pounds of barnacles. But this whale weighs anywhere from around 50 to 60,000 pounds. So having 2,000 pounds of something is really nothing. It's like if we had like I don't want to say a pound or something, but if we just had a little bit of something on us, it wouldn't really bother us. We wouldn't feel the weight of it, but they do have those barnacles. And because of that, they also have whale lice. So you can see that orangey coloration on their bodies. Kaya's making faces and it's not like the lice we get in our hair. If you've ever gotten lice before or anything like that, it's just on their bodies. And actually when gray whales um, were facing some problems out in the ocean and their numbers weren't really thriving, we also saw a decline in the the existence of that whale lice because you can only find it on gray whales. 
So that's a really, really great question. That's actually another way we're also able to identify gray whales are by these barnacles. Because when those barnacles, if they were to fall off, um, you can still see the markings of them. And it's very unique to every single whale. And you can see more of those barnacles. Oh, and this gray whale is eating as well, which is why you're seeing that coloration. And sometimes you'll also see that coloration if they go to the bathroom. Um, so we do have another question and it's, I'm being asked, is the warmer water for the babies? And it definitely does help um, the babies to being born in warm water versus that really cold water out in Alaska um, as a protection and just for their body temperature, all those different things and um, that warmer water will be helping them. So let's just review our five things that make a mammal a mammal. So we spoke about breathing air. We spoke about being warm blooded. Um, then we had hair, we had eats milk, and we also had live birth. And there's a very cool acronym I actually want to show you. So we'll go over to our Explorer camera. And you can think about this when you think about whales and you're trying to remember about what makes a mammal a mammal. Just give me a second, friends, and I'll get this all set up for us. So it's going to be the acronym whale. So here we are, W-H-A-L-E, and can we see that kind of? Oop, that's as much as I can zoom out. So here we have whale, um, whale, and that W is going to be warm-blooded, actually. Like we spoke about, we are all warm-blooded. We need that constant temperature in our bodies. Then H is going to be hair like we spoke about. And you can try filling these in if you want before I do to see if you can figure them out. A is going to be air. We need to breathe air. Then we have L, which is going to be live birth. And then E, which is going to be eats milk because that milk is super, super fatty for them. But this is how you're able to know the five things that make a mammal a mammal. And like I said, there are exceptions to this. But we're just going to ignore animals like the platypus who lay eggs. It's fine. <laughs> but here we have our five things that do make a mammal a mammal and our acronym. So we've spoken about what makes a mammal a mammal. So how whales are mammals. Um, we learned our whale acronym. We talked about baleen versus tooth whales. Um, so, and now I just want to make some observations on different whales, um, is what we can look at. So here we're looking at that fluke part, and I've spoken about how we're able to take pictures of these different whales and go out and do these different things and identify them, and this fluke is definitely a really great example as to how we're able to do that, because depending on the whale, the fluke will be very, very unique to them. So those gray whales have those barnacles, and whales like humpback whales will actually have um, a different um, patterns on them with that white coloration and here you can get a really good look at this Ooh, and I am being asked what my favorite whale is and my favorite whale are actually humpback whales humpback whales are super super cool in my opinion and um, they're very charismatic they have their own personalities to them so a lot of the times when you're on the boat and you, I hear that there's a humpback whale out there, I get super excited because they do have a bunch of different behaviors that they'll actually do. Sometimes they'll be just hanging out kind of normal. That's not too typical though, but they can do breaching, which is coming up on the water. I've seen a humpback whale rolling around in beds of kelp, which is really cute because it was rolling around. Imagine me rolling, I guess, as a whale. And then it came up, and then you can just see the kelp that was on top of its head. Um, so that was definitely very, very cute. I'm very curious as to what your favorite whales are, too, if you want, you can feel free to send it in. But here we do have a humpback that you can see. And you can also see that white coloration, which are those really nice long flippers um, that this whale does have. And let me step off of the camera so like that you can take a good look at this humpback whale and what is occurring in the video. But they're definitely, like I said, very cute. And they are a type of um, baleen whale, if you're curious too, as to what category they fall into. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, how could I forget one of the most important parts? I'm very glad we have Kaya in the studio today. Um, they are very well known for their singing underwater, too. And it's not singing like ours. I don't want to sing for you. I'm sure we don't want to hear it. Um, but they are very vocal. And those songs can go on for a really, really long time. And you can hear them from very far away, too. And that's how they're able to communicate with one, one another, too. It's actually been studied that different pods of these humpback whales will have different songs and different things when um, different situations are occurring too. So humpback whales, definitely my favorite. So we did speak about humpback whales and all these different whales. I do want to take a minute to speak about dolphins though. So like I mentioned, like dolphins are a type of whale. I am being asked, what does a humpback whale sound like? So I'm sorry, I said I wasn't going to do this, but you're clearly very curious as to what a humpback whale sounds like. Um, let me, let me think. Mm, they sound like, they're just going like, uh, they just sound very good, huh? You can look up a video and you'll get a better idea than that. They sound a lot better than I do, trust me, okay? You won't regret looking up a video, but I'll just go, <laughs> different influxes and different tones and everything is how that, those humpback whales are able to sound like. Um, but here, okay, we do have, um, a humpback whale and this is a bottlenose dolphin that we are observing in this picture down here. So here we have baleen whale versus tooth whale. And um, these dolphins can have a lot of different behaviors depending on the dolphins that you are observing as well. So these are bottlenose dolphins, which you might be very, very familiar with. And um, often these dolphins can be acrobatic, jump out of the water and do different things like that. And different ways, if you're going out on a whale watch or if you're at the beach and you see dolphins coming out of the water, they do have different behaviors. One of those behaviors when they come in and out and in and out is what you call porpoising. So even though they aren't a type of porpoise, um, the vaquita is a type of porpoise. It's a really great example. They'll still do this behavior. However, this is a common dolphin that we are observing. So this coloration that you see right here um, is what's going to tell you that. And what you'll notice this is a really great example, actually. If you're looking closely enough, you can see it on the different whales we're observing. You can really see it here. It's what you call counter shading. So that means that the top of their body is going to be that darker coloration, while the bottom of their body is typically going to be a lighter color. So before I tell you why, I just want you to take a second to think about it. Why do you think animals have counter shading? Think about them swimming out in the ocean and how that can help them. So, if an animal was swimming above this dolphin or that those different whales, and a lot of fish will actually have this as well, this darker coloration is going to do a really great job of blending in with the darker blues of the ocean if you're looking on down. So they'll do a better job at camouflaging with those blues. While the slighter coloration down here at the bottom if I was below this dolphin and looking up, it's going to do a really great job of blending in with the sun and those lighter blues of the sun and how it's hitting the water as well. So like I said, you'll find this on a lot of different animals is going to be this counter shading coloration. And it does look okay. I'm getting a question in. Ooh, and I'm being asked, why do dolphins have one blowhole, but gray whales have two? So baleen whales, I do want to mention, will have two blowholes while tooth whales will have one blowhole. You can't see the second blowhole on dolphins because it's actually turned inwards. And that's how they're able to do different things like echolocation. And echolocation is one of the ways how they're able to find their food. If you've watched Finding Dory, you may have learned all about echolocation, how they're able to transit um, transmit those different sounds and then the way that it reflects or bounces back is how they know the distance of different things so they'll actually use that um, to be able to catch their food and do different things like that they'll actually work together so these pods of dolphins I know we saw those orcas earlier who were swimming all together but these pods of dolphins can come in so many different sizes sometimes you'll only see 5 to 15 of them but there's also what you call super pods and those are pods that are just in the 
thousands. So they will often go together and it's kind of like a stampede and they'll find a spot where they can feed and then they'll help each other in different ways going down to the food in different directions. They'll splash on up to get the food to come to the surface, which is why often you'll actually see birds um, in these groups of dolphins who are feeding. And often that also means that there are whales in the groups as well. But that's just a few different things about whales. We can definitely talk about whales for hours and hours because there's so many of them and they're so unique to one another. Um, here we have another picture of a whale. I'm not too sure what type of whale this is. Oh, this is a fin whale that we are looking at. I've never seen a fin whale out in the ocean. They're actually called kind of like the ninjas of the sea because they'll just, you'll see them once and then they'll disappear because they're able to um, swim on away very, very quickly. They're like the greyhounds of the sea too is um, another saying for them. But I do want to say, friends, thank you so much for joining us today for our whale class. Um, I had a whaley good time. Um, but if you do want to send any of those last minute questions or anything, and you're definitely still able to, but instead of using that live text line, uh, feel free to use our email at live at lbaop.org. But thank you once again and have a good rest of your Thursday. We do have another program coming up next at 10 o'clock that's going to be on sharks and conservation so i definitely do invite you to join us there but bye friends